What is the New Testament truth about Israel and Jesus Christ? The answer will shock you on His voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. We are continuing a special series dealing with controversial Israel issues. I'm Steve Wahlberg, the Speaker Director of Whitehorse Media. As I've mentioned before, I'm Jewish, and we are going to tackle uh, issues in the New Testament concerning Israel, concerning the nation of Israel, and today our topic is called Israel and Jesus Christ. This is going to be an amazing Bible study. I'd like to start with the book of Luke, chapter 24, the end of the Gospel of Luke, after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus met with his disciples and he gave them a Bible study. And in verse 27, the scripture says that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them, to his disciples, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus, in his post-resurrection appearance to his disciples, he gave them a Bible study uh, from the prophets and from all the scriptures, showing how these scriptures pointed to, to himself, how he was really the center of Bible prophecy. In verse 20, in verse 44, I'm sorry, 44, continuing, he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So again, Jesus went back to Moses, he went back to the prophets, he went to the Psalms, and he showed how everything in these books really pointed forward uh, in all the scriptures to him. He's the center of everything. And then in verse 45, the Bible says, then he opened their understanding. Some versions say he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus uh, put a little key into their heads and, and turned the key and he opened a lock inside their minds and then they were able to understand the scriptures that Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms ultimately pointed forward to him. Jesus is the great center of the whole Bible. He wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the center of my life. And the only way that we're going to get ready for his return is if we are centered in him. Now, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to do a study on Israel. And then we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to talk about Jesus. And we're going to put some amazing uh, pieces together that are extremely eye-opening. Uh, just like Jesus says, he, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Going all the way back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, let's talk about the word Israel. The very first time the word Israel is ever used is in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. Uh, the great British statesman Winston Churchill once, once said, the farther backward we look, the farther forward we can see. And it's certainly true in Genesis that as we go back to Genesis and try to really understand what it's saying, it'll help us to understand the future and the big issues in the days ahead. Genesis chapter 32, verses 24 to 28, describes a wrestling match between a man named Jacob with an angel. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he prevailed not against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then the man said, and this was an angel of God, the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And the man said to Jacob, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Jacob. Now the word Jacob, the name Jacob actually means deceiver or crook. And Jacob had been a deceiver. He had deceived his father Isaac. He pretended to be Esau. Uh, that got him into a lot of trouble. He had to leave his family and go spend years with Laban 
Uh, then he got married. He had two wives now and a lots, of, lots of children, and they were on their way back. He got word that Esau was coming to meet him with uh, 400 men, and there was probably uh, a battle ahead of him, and Esau was angry, and he was probably going to try to kill him. So Jacob realized that it was his own sin that had got himself into this mess. That's why Esau was so upset with him. And so that night, uh, under the stars, he prayed, and then a man wrestled with him. He thought the man was probably Esau, but it wasn't. It was, it was uh, God's messenger, God's holy messenger, and they wrestled all night, and finally the messenger touched Jacob's uh, thigh, knocked him out of joint, knocked it out of joint, and that put Jacob down on his knees as a broken man, uh, needing all the help that God could give him. And he said, let me go. And then Jacob said, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. You've got to bless me. And then he said, what's your name? And Jacob acknowledged, my name is Jacob. I'm, I'm the deceiver. I'm the crook. Uh, and that basically was Jacob's acknowledgement of himself and of his sin. And then as a broken man, uh, down on his knees, realizing that his own life and his family's life was at stake from Esau, Jacob held on for dear life. And then the messenger looked at him and he said something amazing. He said in verse 28, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, no more Jacob, but it is Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Uh, God changed Jacob's name because he was now a humbled man, he was a broken man, he was a trusting man, he was a repentant man, and God changed his name, gave him a new name, and the new name was Israel. And the word Israel literally means prince of God. And so the messenger said, your name is now Israel for as a prince you have had power with God and with men and have prevailed. Now here's my point. Very important to recognize that the very first time the word Israel is used in the Bible, it was a deeply spiritual name given by a messenger of God to a broken man who was now trusting the Lord with his whole heart, and it meant that he was now a prince of God. He was now uh, fully God's man who was on God's side and whose life had been changed. So the word Israel, first time in the Bible, Genesis 32, 28, right here, Originally, the first time it applied not to a people, but to one particular person, to Jacob's, to Jacob, whose name was now Israel. Now, when you go on in biblical history, we discover that, um, as I mentioned, Jacob had kids. He had a lot of kids, uh, and these became known as the children of Israel, his new name. When you go to Exodus chapter 1, Farther on in biblical history, it talks about the names of the children of Israel, who was the children of Jacob, who were the children of Jacob, who came into Egypt, and it lists their names. And then it says in verse 5 that Joseph was already in Egypt. Now remember this, Joseph is mentioned here. Joseph was a man who had uh, dreams in Egypt that God gave him, and I'll, I'm going to come back to that point. So uh, Israel and his children go to Egypt and they begin to multiply and they eventually uh, run into trouble with Pharaoh and God raises up Moses, sends him to Pharaoh with a message and in Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus uh, 4, 22, in the name of God, Moses addresses Pharaoh and he says in verse 22, thus shall you say to Pharaoh, God said to Moses, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son even my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me in the wilderness. Now here, uh, through Moses, God is telling Pharaoh, Israel is his son. So first of all, Israel was, a, was one man. But when they got into Egypt and multiplied, then God looked at the whole nation and he called them Israel. So you've got Israel as a man and Israel is a nation. And also, uh, it's significant that God called Israel his son. As we keep reading Old Testament history, of course, a lot of things happen. Uh, you can read your Bible and you can discover what the history is of the nation of Israel. But I want to bring out a number of uh, scriptures that clearly talk about Israel and we'll draw some parallels when we get to the, the life of Jesus. Uh, in Psalm 80, verse 8, Psalm 80, verse 8, it's clearly talking about the Exodus and about Israel coming out of Egypt, 
And in verse 8, Psalm 80, verse 8, David wrote in his prayer, he said, You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the heathen and planted it. So when God brought Israel out of Egypt and then brought Israel into the land, the promised land, David referred to Israel as a vine. So Israel was God's son and Israel was a vine. When we look at uh, Isaiah 41, verse 8, and these may seem like uh, insignificant texts, but they're going to have a lot of meaning in just a little bit, so stick with me. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, this is what the Bible says. God refers to Israel. He says, But you, Israel, you are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So, Israel is called God's servant, and Israel is the seed of Abraham. Very clear. Israel was God's son, Exodus 4.22. Israel was God's vine, uh, Psalm 80, verse 8. And Israel is also called the seed of Abraham. Now, when we go to Hosea 11.1, there's an amazing statement, and it, it actually will become amazing when we look at it in the New Testament. But Hosea 11.1 1 is in its historical context. It's a statement about Israelite history. Verse 1, Hosea 11.1 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, God said, and I called my son out of Egypt. Now this is a reference to the, to the Exodus. Israel was God's son, as we already saw in Exodus 4.22. Uh, God called Israel his son. He told that to Pharaoh. And this verse says, when Israel was a child, I loved him and I called my son out of Egypt. God brought his son, Israel, out of Egypt in the time of Moses. When we go to the New Testament, the very first sentence of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 says, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. This book is about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the center of prophecy. He's the center of everything. In chapter 2 verse 1 says, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the days of Herod the king, somebody once said, uh, the hinge of history is a, a door to a Bethlehem stable. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the days of Herod the king, quite a bit happened. Uh, in this chapter, Herod was uh, threatened when he got the news from the wise men about the birth of this child. And when the wise men did not come back to uh, tell him where the baby had been born, he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to kill all the male baby boys under two years old. Now, God was watching out for his son, for watching out for Jesus, and it talks about how uh, Jesus' earthly dad, his name was Joseph. And verse 12 says that he was warned of God in a dream. Or actually, um, I'm sorry, verse 12 talks about the wise men being warned of God in a dream. Verse 13 says, when the wise men departed, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So here's Joseph having a dream. And he said, arise, take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Go to Egypt because Herod's going to try to destroy this child. And so Joseph, who had, he was having dreams himself, he took Jesus to Egypt. And the Bible says that they were there. In verse 15, they were there until the death of Herod. Now listen to this. Matthew 2, 15. He was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called my son. This is amazing. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus goes down into Egypt, and then Jesus comes out of Egypt, and Matthew, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said that when Jesus came out of Egypt, this was fulfilling the scripture which said, out of Egypt I have called my son, which is a quote from Hosea chapter 11, 1 that applied to the nation of Israel, which Matthew in chapter 2 verse 15 is now applying as fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, this is just the beginning of a whole host of amazing uh, parallels that I would like to, to share with you for your
consideration. Think about these par parallels. Uh, in the Old Testament, Israel is mentioned in the book of Genesis the first time. Israel was a man and then Israel was a people, the nation of Israel. And Israel went down into Egypt and there was a man named Joseph who was one of the children of Israel and he was already there in Egypt and he had many dreams. Uh, in the New Testament, first book of the New Testament, we have in the book of Matthew, we have another Joseph who is the earthly father of Jesus and he's also having dreams. In the Old Testament, Israel uh, goes down into Egypt. In the New Testament, Jesus goes down into Egypt. In the Old Testament, God's son Israel comes out of Egypt and in Matthew chapter 2, Jesus Christ, God's son, comes out of Egypt, fulfilling Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. In the Old Testament, when Israel came out of Egypt, they went through the sea. They promptly went through the Red Sea. The water opened up. And in the New Testament, um, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, what happens is, I'm sorry, verses 13 to 15, uh, Jesus Christ is, is baptized. And Jesus told John the Baptist when he went into the water that we must do this because we must fulfill all righteousness. Uh, it's also interesting that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when Paul talked about Israel coming out of Egypt and then going through the Red Sea, he said that Israel was baptized into Moses and in the cloud in the sea. So Paul referred to Israel going through the water as a baptism. And in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus Christ, God's son, was baptized. And Jesus said, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. In the Old Testament, when Israel came out of Egypt and they went through the water, then they wandered in the wilderness for how many years? For 40 years. In the New Testament, after in Matthew 3, Jesus goes through the water and is baptized in the very next chapter, in chapter 4, Matthew 4, the Bible says that Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted. And how many days did he fast? Forty days and forty nights. And then he was hungry. So Israel was in the wilderness for forty years and Jesus, after his baptism, was in the wilderness for forty days. Forty-forty. Now, why was that? You know, why wasn't it fifty or thirty? Well, there's a reason, a specific reason, and I'll, I'll build this case as we continue on, that Jesus was fulfilling the history of ancient Israel. Uh, when Israel was in the wilderness, it says in, in Deuteronomy, the scripture there says in chapter 8 that Israel was to learn through their history in the wilderness that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in Matthew chapter 4, during the 40 days, Jesus was tempted three times by the devil. There's three temptations. And every time Jesus was tempted by Satan, he answered with a scripture. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written, three times. Where were those scriptures from that Jesus Christ quoted in Matthew chapter 4? Believe it or not, every single one of those verses is from the book of Deuteronomy, which was the book that God gave Israel when Israel was in the wilderness. Same texts. When Israel came out of Egypt, they also went to Mount Sinai, and God made a covenant with the nation of Israel, and that's where he gave them the Ten Commandments to the 12 tribes. In the New Testament, at the end of Jesus' life, he met with his 12 uh, disciples and he made a new covenant with them in Matthew chapter 26. We've already read that uh, Israel was called God's vine in Psalm 80 verse 8 and in John chapter 15 verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. So Jesus applied the vine to himself. Uh, in Isaiah 41 verse 8, we read that Israel is the seed of Abraham. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, we have an amazing statement from Paul. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, about the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3, 16. Paul wrote, Now to Abraham and his seed in the Old Testament were the promises made. He does not say seeds. There's that on there, as of many, but as of 
one. And then he, he quotes the scripture that says, and to your seed. The promises were made to Abraham and his seed in the Old Testament. Not seeds, Paul says, but seed. And then Paul gives us the, the punchline, the, the, he drops a bomb, a spiritual bomb. And to your seed, which is Christ, which is Christ, which is Christ. So Paul says, God made promises to Abraham and his seed. He does not say seeds, but he says seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself. He is the seed, the seed, the seed of Abraham. In the Old Testament, Israel started out as a man, and then it was a people. Paul said the seed is Christ, but going on in Galatians 3.29, he said, verse 29 says, and to Gentiles, Paul wrote, if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. So just like it was a man and a people, so in the New Testament, it's, a man, it's the seed is Christ and then it's those who belong to Christ, those who are in Christ, whether it's Jews or Gentiles, they are in Christ and they become part of the seed of Abraham. So just to summarize this history, in the Old Testament there was a Joseph, in New Testament Joseph. In the Old Testament he had dreams, New Testament there were dreams. Old Testament Israel went to Egypt, New Testament Israel went to Egypt, Jesus went to Egypt, and then Jesus came out of, in the Old Testament Israel came out of Egypt, in the New Testament Jesus came out of Egypt. In the Old Testament Israel was baptized in the water, in the New Testament Jesus Christ was baptized in the water. In the Old Testament Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, in the New Testament Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, using the same text that Israel got in Deuteronomy. Twelve tribes in the Old Testament, twelve apostles in the New. God's vine in the Old Testament, Jesus is God's vine in the New. The seed of Abraham is Israel in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is the seed in the New Testament, and just like Israel was, was, a, was one man and then a people, so in the book of uh, Galatians, the seed, the primary seed is Jesus Christ, but it's not just Christ, it's those that are in Christ, whether Jews or Gentiles who are brought in, who become part of God's seed. Galatians 3, I'm sorry, Galatians 6, 16, then puts it all together, Galatians 6.16 talks about uh, the Israel of God. It's not circumcision, it's not uncircumcision, Paul said, it's a new creature. And then he said, uh, mercy and peace be upon those who follow this rule and upon the Israel, the Israel of God. Uh, the word Israel means Prince of God. Jacob was a broken man, God changed his name, gave him a spiritual name, Israel meaning he had become a prince of God. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is the primary prince of God. He is the prince of peace, according to the book of Isaiah. He is the center of everything. Jesus, when he was resurrected, opened the minds of his disciples, gave them a Bible study, and showed them how all these scriptures ultimately point forward to him. Jesus is the center of everything. The whole book pointed points forward to him. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, points forward to him. According to the book of Galatian, Galatians, Jesus is the seed, and those who are in him are part of the seed. Jesus Christ is the Prince of God, and that is the meaning of the word Israel. Israel means Prince of God. Now, let's, as we near the conclusion of this uh, amazing study, let's go to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16 describes a final war, a final conflict. 16, 16 says, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Armageddon is the last great battle. It's the great battle between God and the forces of the devil. Now, I strongly believe that Israel is going to be at the center of this war. But this is the big question, and we talked about this in the last program, and we'll have a further Bible study in a future program as we deal with Israel, Babylon, and Armageddon. But this is the big issue. When the Battle of Armageddon hits, uh, who is at the center of this battle? Who, is, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Uh, and I will build my case very clearly that the center of this battle is Israel. 
and that Israel is the Prince of God. It's the primary Israel, Jesus Christ, and it is also those who are in Christ, Jews and Gentiles together who believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. Revelation 17 verse 14 talks about the beast and all of its world forces. And verse 14 says, These shall make war. And who are they making war with? With the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The Lamb is the center of the book of Revelation. Jesus wants to put a key in our heads and open the, the doors of our minds so we can understand that all the scripture is centered in him. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the center of the storm and those that are in Christ, those that are faithful to Christ, those that follow Christ, those that believe in Christ, that believe in the message of the Old Testament, the message of the New Testament, that put both Testaments together and see everything as centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll continue this. We've got more to come. I hope you'll stick with me for the next program of His Voice today. God bless you.